We're going to talk about the nature of dialogue. Some of our comments will be taken by a book by Daniel Yankelevich called The Magic of Dialogue. And we'll talk about some of the elements of dialogue and then look at that in Jesus' ministry. Um, dialogue played a central role in, according to Yankelevich, the reversing the nuclear arms race and ending the Cold War. After the Reagan presidency, George Shultz, who had been Reagan's Secretary of State, asked Mikhail Gorbachev, former president of the Soviet Union, what the turning point was in the Cold War. Reykjavik, Gorbachev said unhesitatingly, Reykjavik, Iceland. And at their meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland, he and Ronald Reagan had, for the first time, entered into genuine dialogue. There was a lapse in the official negotiations, and it lapsed into more of just a conversation between them. They went past the main agenda, which was armed controls. What they ended up doing, they talked about their values, the assumptions that they had going into leadership, the aspirations they had as they led the two nations, and as a result of that time of connection, a bond of trust was formed that ended up, in Gorbachev's words, he credited this dialogue with establishing enough trust and mutual understanding to begin to reverse the nuclear arms race. That's dialogue. Dialogue comes from a Greek word, two-part word, dia and log. Dia means through. We think of dialogue and we contrast it with monologue. And when we think of dialogue, we think of a conversation between two people. That's not really what dia means. Dua means to. Dia means through. And log, it comes from the word from which we get the word logos. If you think of Jesus, Jesus is called the logos or the word. So dia, logos, literally means through words, through words. And they get the sense that dialogue, when it occurs, wall, words penetrate the walls between people. We naturally have walls between us. What happens in dialogue is that words get through the walls to another person, and their words get through the walls to me, and it establishes mutual understanding. That's the purpose of dialogue, is mutual understanding. And what we'll see is to practice dialogue is to express wisdom from above. When the Bible talks about the difference between earthly wisdom and divine wisdom, what it describes is that divine wisdom prioritizes mutual understanding, the expression of words that go through walls, that take down walls. In fact, when it talks about really what the cross accomplishes, the power of the cross, it, that it, it affects the destruction of walls between races, between classes, between gender. The cross knocks down walls. Divine wisdom, look what it says in your worship folder in James 3. It's kind of the verse that we'll, we'll come back to as we go through this series, it says the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. It gives three characteristics that describe the wisdom from above, and it contrasts the wisdom from above with the wisdom that is earthly, natural. And it says the wisdom from above gives it three words, peace-loving, considerate, and submissive. Very quickly, peace-loving, well, peace is the opposite of war. The wisdom from above doesn't create war. It removes it. And that's how it characterizes God's wisdom. Divine wisdom affects the laying down of arms when it's applied. Peace-loving. Considerate. To be considerate, the word literally, it has the sense of being similar or resembling. And so to be considerate then is to find common ground, to sit down and to find out not ways that we differ, but ways that we're alike. That's what it means to be in the context considerate, that we, again, find common grounds. We build bridges between us. The wisdom from above prioritizes peace, it looks for common ground, 
And then it says that it is submissive. Submissive, it's, but when we think of submissive, it's not really the sense for the word. It has the sense of being able to be persuaded. That's literally what submissive means, well persuaded. It's a person who's open-minded, that is open to hearing about something, that you can talk to them and they listen and they will take into consideration the things that you're saying. That's what it means to be considerate. It can have the sense of submissive, but that's not really it. It's not a person who lies down and says, you can do whatever you want. It's a person that sits forward in the chair, and they say, tell me more. I want to understand. I don't quite understand where you're coming from. Explain it to me a little bit more. That's the image that we get for the wisdom from above. It is, I don't want to have war with you. I want this to be something where we talk with each other. I want to find common ground. I want to understand. Talk to me. That's what God's wisdom, that's what the wisdom from above looks like. It builds bridges of understanding it practices a, ver a word, a phrase we use a lot, connection, then correction. Connection, then correction. Oftentimes, we, especially as Westerners, we want to make decisions. Let's cut to the chase. Other cultures are not so bent on figuring out what we do. Chinese culture, they have a, they call it guanxi. And when you do business in China, what's going to happen, you're going to go there, and from the West, we have a tendency to be pretty linear and very contractual. And so what we'll do, we'll go over to China and say, okay, here's exactly what we'll do. We're going to do this, 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 and this. And people go into business in China, they find people going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. And so business, Westerners, leaving on the, on the plane and saying, how did it go? We nailed them. We, it, was just, it was beautiful. I, I told them what we were going to do, and then they shook their heads and had great, and then they think the contract's in the bag. They come back. And so are we ready to do this thing? No, we need to sit down again. Why do we need to sit down? I told you what we were going to do. But we don't have guanxi. Guanxi. What's guanxi? You know what guanxi is? Relationship. Relationship. So the the, the Chinese, Mei Guanxi. Mei is no. Guanxi relationship. We have no relationship. So what do we need to do? Let's sit down again. Tell me about yourself. I'm going to tell you about myself. And you know what they find? That if you understand the person sitting across the table, you don't have to have everything spelled out as clearly in a contract. You trust the person. You understand where they're coming from. That's why Chinese negotiations tend to be a little bit different. Again, there's something to be said for both, but divine wisdom doesn't throw out the whole idea of being peace-loving, finding common ground, establishing mutual understanding. Especially in religious contexts, dialogue seems to be a dying art. Spiritual influence, we'll see in Jesus, requires dialogue. They really don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've heard that, right? They don't care how much you know. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. What do you need to do to show them you care? Talk with them. Don't just store up ammunition to debate. That's not the way spiritual influence occurs. They don't want to be told, bump, bump, bump. But, and the, it gets to there, but you remember, it's connection, then correction. We tend to skip the connection part. We go right on to discussion and debate, thinking that we can influence people via discussion and debate to change from the heart. That doesn't make much sense, does it? In order to change somebody's heart, you've got to listen to their heart. That's where dialogue comes in. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about the things that you value. I'm interested. We're not the same. I want to understand. That's what dialogue does. It breaks down walls. It's through words. Words that your words come to me, my words come to you. That's dialogue. There's three Ds of communication there's dialogue, debate, and discussion. 
There can be other Ds, those three work. Dialogue, debate, discussion. They're different. Dialogue differs from discussion. Discussion is batting forth ideas. We can bat ideas back and forth with each other. We're, very, we're fairly comfortable with that as a culture. Dialogue's different because it's not just the batting forth of ideas, it's really listening not to just the ideas, but why do you believe that? Tell me about the things that are important to you. That discussion doesn't, oh, in fact, discussion tends to veer away from that. We're just, we're just having an intellectual discussion. So, I, you know, usually we don't get into the deep things, but dialogue does. Dialogue and debate are very different. If, in fact, if there's an opposite of dialogue, debate is probably it. Debate, the purpose of debate is to win an argument. It's to vanquish an opponent. That is not the purpose of dialogue. See, in dialogue, if dialogue occurs, everybody wins. If it doesn't occur, everybody loses. Because if we establish some sense of connection, you win and I win, why? We might not agree, but I understand you. You understand me. We have some level of guanxi. The framework of understanding. That's what dialogue provides. The worst possible way to advance mutual understanding is to win debating points at the expense of others. In order for dialogue to occur, three elements must be in place, and we'll look at each of these. We'll just review them, and then over the coming weeks, we'll take them one at a time. Equality, empathy, and exploration. Briefly, equality, empathy, and exploration. Equality. Dialogue becomes possible only after trust has been built, and the people have for the occasion removed their badges of authority and are participating as true equals. It has to be two things. You had to be sitting, there has to be trust, and you have to be sitting in a place where everybody can share. Everybody's invited to talk. That doesn't happen right away. You can, I think, sometimes in work situations, we're put in places where we really want to hear, but then the boss is sitting behind the big seat, and you get the sense that they really don't want to hear what I have to say. Now, some of you probably have been in those meetings. <laughs> you, you, you must think I'm crazy. I, you really don't want to hear what I have to say. And so that's why at those tell us about things, sometimes people go, why? There's no trust and there's not equality. Here's what, what empathy, what dialogue has to have. It's we really have to take off the badges of authority. We have to sit them down. We have to sit on the same level. There has to be enough trust that's been forged intentionally to allow you to feel safe. I was talking to a counselor um, from another town, and he was saying about how his staff members, they've been having meetings, and he really wanted to cultivate some sharing on their part, and they, they wouldn't. And this is what his impression of this was. They don't feel safe. So he intentionally did some things to cultivate safety so that they could be around that table and know that really what they had to say he really wanted to hear. After cultivating safety, he then asked the questions again and people started to open up. See, there's got to be equality, which is trust and people laying aside their badges of authority. That's the first element of dialogue. It's got to be in place. It's got to be equality. If you wear the big hat, they're not going to talk. Or if you wear the, uh, it goes either way. Ex empathy, the ability to think somebody else's thoughts and feel someone else's feelings is indispensable to dialogue. There can be discussion without participants responding empathically to one another, but then it's discussion, not dialogue. And again, it's not a counseling session. But what dialogue does, though, is, let me, see, let me, let me, try, to, let me try to understand this. Now, you're saying, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so what you try to do is get at, not that you're going to agree with it, but at least you understand, is this what you're saying? And you work at that. There's got to be empathy. And I'll tell you what shuts down that judgment. See, what we do, rather than seek to understand, we weigh in and we make decisions about how appropriate that is or not. The way to shut down empathy and sharing, judge what somebody else says and says, that's stupid. Dialogue stops. You've got to hold that that's stupid. 
you might say, you know, I don't, I don't quite see it that way. Tell me more. Two ears, one mouth. Dialogue means two to one. Tell me more. And then just be quiet. Lean forward. I want to understand. Sometimes it's not, if sometimes even this can be kind of threatening. Maybe to the side a little bit. The, a front to front thing, this feels adversarial, combative. You might want to turn your chair just a little bit. Lean in. It's not, and so, and if you do that, people will start to open up. Then what you want to do, if it's going to be dialogue, hmm, say more. Hmm. Hmm. And then what ends up happening, then it's not just one-sided. You know, you know where I'm coming from? Here's what, here's what, here's what matters to me. Yeah, wait, I know, I know. We, we'll do decision-making later. I know we have a decision to make. See, that's what ends up happening. Dialogue doesn't happen because we want to move past it fast. That's what we do in the West. Okay, we've got the contract. Let's just get on with decision-making. But dialogue, you have to slow down. Wait a minute, we'll make decisions. That's not the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish now. I want to understand you. And I want you to understand me. And then when we understand each other, then we'll do discussion. Then we'll do decision making. Then we might even do debate. But not until we do dialogue first. If you do dialogue, then you can do those things. If you do those other things first, then dialogue, is, it's more difficult to make happen. Empathy, exploration, and dialogue, participants are encouraged to examine their own assumption and those of other participants. Yankalovich says, and I quote, arguably, arguably the most striking difference between discussion and dialogue is this process of bringing assumptions into the open while sim simultaneously suspending judgment. Bringing assumptions out in the open with, with, and at the same time suspending judgment. Why do you think the things you think? What's important to you? What are you shooting for? What are you trying to accomplish? And listen, don't judge. You're just trying to understand. And, and if you do that, they'll reciprocate. And, and you might, I might hear what you're saying. I don't understand that. But my purpose is not to judge it. It's just, okay. And if you do that, a connection is formed. Yank Alevich says the book, the name of the book, The Magic of Dialogue. Dialogue can be very powerful. Enmity between people, walls, disagreement, intractedness. Tell me more. Well, decision making can wait. Debate can wait. Discussion can wait. I just want to understand. I want to know where you're coming from. I want you to know where I'm coming from. As far as the Cold War is concerned, that was almost magic what happened. That's what. That's what George Schultz heard from Gorbachev. Centuries, centuries of enmity. The magic of dialogue. I think that, um, I, don't, I don't think, God values dialogue. How do you know that? Equality? Jesus doesn't pronounce God's decrees from on. He could have. God could have chosen any way in the world he wanted to to communicate with us. You know what he did? He came down to our level. Became a person. A baby. And grew up occupying the same flesh and blood, the same skin that we do. Empathy? Jesus was great at being empathetic. Exploring both, telling about. Here's who I think the Father is. And again, Jesus, he understood and he judged, but he really understood. People knew he understood. That's why the disciples, 
I have to walk around. I'm too old to jump up. <laughs> the disciples, um, they loved him. I think Jesus was easy to talk to. They spent a lot of time with him. And when they went to debrief after he'd do miracles, they weren't afraid to say, hey, would you explain that to us? We didn't get that. I think that shows, that tells us a lot about Jesus. Jesus told all these parables, and people were out there scratching their heads, and the disciples, when they got him alone, they said, you know, Jesus, I don't get that. And then he'd talk to them. I think Jesus did dialogue a lot. Well, he had to have. You know what Jesus' plan was to reach the world? Think, of, think about the fact that you had three years to reach the world. Three years. And you've got to reach the world because you're going, to be, you're going to be dead in three years. And you've got to communicate a vision of God to these people that will last a couple thousand years. What are you going to do? How do you do that? You know, we would tend to do <laughs> broadcast broadly. You know what Jesus did? He dialogued with 12. I want you to understand. I want you to understand me. You know what happened? Their life changed. Their assumptions about God changed. Their understanding changed. You know why? Because they did dialogue. Spend time. God values dialogue. It's because there's, there's power in gentle persuasion, especially when it involves dialogue. Again, dialogue's got to be gentle. Um, Look at this verse. This is a really interesting verse. Solomon, Solomon said some things that were pretty phenomenal. This is really interesting. I think it was Solomon that wrote this. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. Look at what that says. And a gentle tongue can break a bone. Isn't that a great line? A gentle tongue can break a bone. And it talks about the power of gentle persuasion. Uh, we're going to spend some time studying Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman. Let's give a little background concerning Samaritans in general and this woman in particular so that we can understand what we read. Uh, Samaritans, uh, they come from the northern half of Israel. There's two kingdoms of Israel prior to uh, Solomon's time. There was one prior to Solomon's time, excuse me. After Solomon was king, it divided into two. So there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Prior to that, they had been united. But then, both this, the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. And both, okay. So, so then the northern kingdom, they went into captivity first to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom went into captivity to the Babylonians. 586, 597 B.C., depend, different groups went into captivity. And here's what we know. The Assyrians, when the Assyrians brought the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity, they completely smashed Israel's culture. That's the way they did things. They were incredibly violent. And apparently what they did, they broke people enough, and then they had them intermarry to become Assyrians, and that's the way they handled things. The Babylonians were a little bit different. They didn't eliminate culture. They were still brutal, but they allowed people to retain some of their cultural distinctive. That's why they had problems with Daniel. Daniel was in Babylon with the southern kingdom of Judah. You heard the story, Daniel. And so he would pray, and they'd have issues with it. But if he was in Assyria, he wouldn't have lived to tell about it. But it was Babylon. And they allowed some cultural distinctive. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they ate different things. And so they were allowed to eat vegetables because that's the Babylonians' way. Why do I tell you about this? Because the southern kingdom of Judah, they ended up retaining their cultural identity. The northern kingdom didn't. Now, the captivity ended. Now, they were still under the dominion of Rome, but Rome allowed for a little bit some more you can retain your cultural identity. What ended up happening, those in the south looked down on those in the north. Half-breeds, sellouts. You know, you capitulated, you gave in, you intermarried, and so there was a lot of hostility between the Jews of the south 
and the half-breeds. They wouldn't even call them Jews to the north. In fact, it was so strong that when you went through that area, some of the areas of Samaria, you walked around if you were a good Jew. You didn't even want to walk on their soil. That's how deep the enmity was. Um, that's about uh, southerners and the northerners. Then this woman who was a Samaritan woman, she was over the legal limit of husbands. You could have, at that time, you could have had three. You know, it's better to have one. Three, it's kind of, it's, three would be, I don't, I don't even know the values, point whatever it is. Um, she had five husbands, way, way over the legal limit. And then, and she was living with a guy that wasn't her husband. So what she had to do, she uh, had to draw water during the heat of the day. Everybody, when you drew water, you drew water in the morning and at night. You know, you had to walk a long way. You had the pail. And what you did, you went early in the day and, late, and at dusk. Why? It's not so hot. She went at noontime. Why? She didn't want to get, you know what she didn't want to get, the look. Hmm. Tight-lipped look. Five-time loser living with a guy. <clears throat> That's her. With this background in mind, let's listen to a conversation between God in human form, and this woman that no one would talk to. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining. I mean, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although it, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea in the south and went once more to Galilee, to the north. Now he had to go through Samaria, where they live. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. You know, Jesus, when he came, he didn't need to, he didn't need to have a body that got tired. He didn't need to do that. Why would he do that? Because Jesus was committed to equality. He wanted to understand what we went through. Why would he do that? He wanted to understand. Why is it important that he understands? Is it important to you? How important is it to you? Think about it. Jesus understands what it's like to be tired, to be tempted. Is that important to you? I love that about him. I don't have to pretend with him. He understands. No, he never blew it. I like that too. He's perfect. But he gets it. And he tells us to speak freely with him. And we can because he walked a mile in our shoes. That's the way God does things, by the way. He didn't need to do it that way, but he did. That's divine wisdom. Remember those words? Divine wisdom? Remember what about? Remember what those things were about? Peace loving. Can I tell you a deal? It's going to surprise some of you. God is not at war with you. You say, but he's not at war with you. In fact, you will make headway if you understand that. And that God with you is sympathetic. Let's go on with the... Jacob's well was there, verse 6, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, noontime. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. <laughs> how can you even ask me for a drink? How in the world do you even, how in the world do you even look at me? I mean, you're, you're right down on my level. Why in the world are you looking at me in the eye and saying, woman, can I have a drink? You're not supposed to even look at me. You're supposed to do what everybody else does. You're supposed to look away, or I'm supposed to look away. But Jesus didn't look away. He, he caught her right in the eye, woman. And he said her name because she never would have looked had he not said woman. Woman. And she looked up. Would you give me a drink?
Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus enters into a dialogue with this woman. We're going to look at it over the, over the coming weeks, how he ends up finding out about her. Gives her an opportunity to express some things. Enters into dialogue with her. Powerful? Powerful? Look what happened. Again, you can imagine this woman coming out to draw water at midday. And if we had told her a Jew is going to come along and he's going to talk with what, and here, look, look what happened at the end of this conversation. This is later on. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Here's what happened to this woman. She ends up coming to this place to draw water with the bucket. She ends up having dialogue with Jesus. And then she ends up leaving this place with the bucket. And imagine running into town. You're in the town. Hey, let me, let, me tell you, let me tell you about this guy who told me everything I ever did. We already know what you've done. But she said, no, you don't get it. He told me everything I ever did but didn't give me the look. It's like, but could this be the Savior? Could this be the Messiah? And then, she, so she ran into town. And there's, so when the Samaritans came to him, she goes into town. you are going to meet this guy. So she brings the whole kit and caboodle. Hey! And so she's pointing them out. And this, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. You know what? If we had been there, that's what Jesus is like. He's not the kind of guy that if you talk to him, you'd want to move on. <laughs> Could you hang around a little bit more? I'm not used to talking to people who understand me so well and are yet so clear. Could you hang around a little bit? That's what Jesus was like. You know what? When we get there, Jesus is great. Compassionate, understanding, clear, insightful, gentle, wise, And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. We're going to use the three elements as headings over the next three weeks. Equality, empathy, and exploration. Um, let me close with two enemies of dialogue. These are two things that are going to shut down dialogue really quickly. Hypocrisy and judgment. Hypocrisy and judgment. You want to shut down you want to shut down dialogue? Two things. Be a hypocrite and be judgmental. And dialogue's not going to happen. It's the challenge that you face when you're trying to enter into dialogue. You can't make people lay this down. We can lay it down. Anyways, hypocrisy. Why do I say that? You see, in the passage in James 3. It says, full of mercy and good fruit at the end of 17, impartial and sincere. Those aren't great translations. The word impartial and the word sincere, impartial literally means not hypocritical. Not hypocritical. That's what it says. It's like this word, the opposite of hypocrisy. That's what the wisdom from above is. It's the opposite of hypocrisy and the word sincere literally is not judgmental. That's what it says. The wisdom from above is the opposite of hypocritical and the opposite of judgmental. Think about it. Do you know what hypocrisy and judgment have in common in terms of language? Both of them, in the end of the word, have the word, the Greek word, to judge. You know what hypocrisy is about? I judge something bad in me and I push it under the water. Now, you don't have to air your dirty laundry with everyone, but we need to know what's down there. Somebody who's a hypocrite, well, I heard in a movie once, say, you know what, there's two things I don't like about you. Your face. <laughs> Hypocrisy shuts down judgment. The wisdom from above is not hypocritical. God is not a hypocrite. He doesn't say one thing, but then really want to say another thing. 
And the other thing is not judgmental. It's not judgmental. Um, we have a tendency to not accept things either in ourselves or others. Do you know hypocrisy and judgment, they're related? If I can't accept something in me because I think God is at war with me, I will hide it. I'll hide it. And the reason why we hide things is because we think God is at war with this thing. Do you know what the deal is with this thing? God understands this, the thing that you do. He understands it. When Jesus came, he didn't do it. He is not at war with you. In fact, you know what you need? You need to understand he's not at war with you. You know what we tend to do when we have issues in our life? We tend to call them bad. Now, where some things need to be corrected, do they? Do you have some things that need to be corrected? Do you know the way it goes? Connection, then correction. You know what I'm going to encourage you to do? Have dialogues with yourself. Why do you do the things you do? Be gentle with yourself. Sit down across from yourself. When we label something as bad, we shut down insight. It's bad. You know what's helpful sometimes? Why am I doing this? I remember once. I'll never, ever forget this. It, we, we, I was at this prayer thing, and we were told, confess all your sins to God. I was raised in a way I, I could do that in a minute. So I just started. I remember I did this. I, I told you the story before. I'll do it quick, and then I'm going to close. I started writing my sins down. Because that's what this prayer thing, we said, okay, go write your sins down and ask God to forgive them. So <laughs> that's easy for me. Right, writing, 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 writing. And then here's the sense. Because we were supposed to pray and ask God to tell us what our sin was. I didn't need to do that. I don't need your help. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. And then it, it wasn't a spoken word. You asked me to show you your sin, and then you didn't even let me. It, it, it was this thought that came in the back of my head. And I, it's probably God. But here's, you know what I did? Literally. I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I put my pen down. That fast, I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm not writing anything until I think you're telling me that I need to write it down. And then I was just quiet. Shh. And something ended up, hmm. And here's what I wrote down. I think that I am abandoned. And then I started to cry. All those things that I was doing, that was the deal. I don't have anybody backing me up. And, and so it, it's like if you, if you feel alone, i got to do this, this, this. You know what God did? He went, stop, look at that. What is that about? I, I'm acting like an abandoned child. That was a beginning for me. And coming to God being less quick. Now, again, there's things I have to deal with, but connection. God, I'm doing this. I don't get it. I'm like, why am I spewing all over people? And in the conversation, the dialogue. I remember I used to do that. Confession was about getting rid of the sins and then getting to a place where I, could, I wouldn't trade what I have now for that for anything. It used to be like I'd go to a doctor's, you know, go to a doctor's office and go hear my symptoms and then leave. You know, I'm, 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 I have a headache, backache. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> How stupid is that? You know, you know what, I, what more, it's just more like now, I'm angry, I'm, I'm geez, I, I'm really anxious. Breathe. And sometimes I find out what's happening underneath the surface. Worship team, come on up. Okay. I'm going to sing a song. Channel persuasion is powerful. Divine wisdom promotes understanding both within and between. And don't you think those are, do you think if we become more understanding with ourselves, we can be more understanding with others? Being more understanding with others, we can be more understanding with ourselves. That's why divine, divine wisdom 
finds common ground, builds bridges, and is open to understanding.